to start this off, this is August the 27th, 28th, defending. We probably talked about a bunch of this material in class on the 27th. So this video is going to cover that material again and also stuff that we probably didn't cover in class. So if you need to skip ahead, skip ahead and watch the stuff that you don't know. If you want to watch the whole thing again, watch the whole thing again so you really make sure it sticks in the brain cells. And if you want to like just do the half that you need to do and then maybe come back later to the other, all the power to you. So let's get started. It's going to be the most exciting and depressing lecture probably of the year. Uh, we're talking about slavery, so it's not going to be happy-go-lucky. It's going to be a little sad, depressing, and like, why are we like this to each other? And I get it, but in order to understand history, you just got to take a bite of it and chew. So here we go. So why slavery? So the big thing that you're going to need to know is why there was a rush for slavery in the United States. Understand there's different time periods where slavery was a boom. Okay, the very first boom for slavery in the colonies actually had nothing to do with cotton. It had to do with tobacco, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about the boom that's going to come back later, okay, in the 1800s. And what it is is an invention that causes it, the cotton gin. The cotton gin is the invention. Like, of all the inventions you're going to need to know for at least the first few uh, units, cotton gin, cotton gin, cotton gin. What, this, what the cotton gin did is it took something like cotton and made it easy to separate. So there's two parts. you got to take the cotton out of the fields, and then you have to spread the cotton out to make it into fabric to make it into shirts and clothing. Well, the spreading it out takes forever. And the cotton gin, really quick, good to go. But we need still a, a labor force that's going to pick the cotton. And America is all about making money back then, so how can we do this to make the most money about this? Let's get cheap labor in the form of slaves. Let's talk about, we're going to rewind the tape now. Where did this all start as far as getting slaves from Africa? How did that start? Because that is a little further back. Well, we have Europe. Bum, ba, da, ba, pa, pa, pa. And we have Africa. Bum, ba, da, pa, pa, pa. Europe and Africa have, for centuries, traded with one another, fought with one another, exchanged cultures with one another. They've done like any other group of people living next to each other would do. They would interact in different ways. However, there's a change. There's a change in the way they interact. The change is Europeans are now going to look to African nations as a source to mine human slaves to get them to transport to the Americas for different types of products to be made. Why did this change take place? How did it change take place? Those are important questions that we need to answer. The word to really remember, dehumanize. Because if you have a group of people that interact with another group of people, for a period of time, doesn't matter if they're going to war, doesn't matter if they're trading goods, doesn't matter if they're exchanging culture, they are still viewing each other as human beings. In order to get somebody and treat them less than a human being, like a slave, you have to dehumanize them. You have to give them characteristics that make them less than human. And what they did is they focused on the easiest trait, and that is what we can see, their skin color. And understand there is, there is a misconception of how slaves were actually captured here and brought to the Americas that has gone on for a while that we have to crush. Europeans, by at large, did not go down to Africa and throw nets over Africans and then bring them over in ships. That is not how it went down for the majority of it. The majority of it is you have nations in Africa that fight each other. And because Europeans are looking for slave labor, the nations that won those fights would sell the slaves to Europeans that would ship them across uh, the Atlantic. There's a vicious cycle that takes place. These countries that are selling slaves to Europeans, Europeans, those Europeans are going to give guns to those countries. Now you have guns, in, or you have Africa nations that have guns that are fighting other African nations that don't have as many guns or no guns at all. Who do you think is going to win? It empowered those people that could enslave fellow Africans, sell them to Europeans, and send them across the way. Another misconception to squash right away is the actual number of African Americans being uh, exported to the Americas in the beginning. There actually wasn't a lot of uh, slaves that were sent to North America, or specifically the colonies in the beginning. Most of the African American slaves, or African slaves, were sent to Central America and South America. Only about 5 to 10% actually went to the colonies. So now we talked about how this started. Now we're going to talk about what it was like. Let's get at it.
the reason why Europeans were taking slaves to the Americas and how they were doing it as far as psychologically. They were dehumanizing the group of people that lived in Africa to justify their actions of treating them less than human by making them slaves. So now I want to talk about the actual slave ships themselves and that middle passage. That's the kind of like the, the, the term to know, if you will. It's not going to be on a test, but it's going to be how videos that you're going to watch are going to refer to it. Um, and how maybe some readings that you'll do that will refer to it. The Middle Passage is just the ship going from the African uh, continent to the Americas. It's that passage there. Now, this passage will take 12 million slaves from Africa, uh, to or from Africa to the Americas over a couple centuries. And out of those 12 million, about 2 million are going to die just on the ships themselves or through that Middle Passage. We're going to talk about why. And the big reason is sanitary reasons. Um, men were chained typically with another man uh, the entire trip. I showed you pictures in the, inside, the, inside the class recently about what that looked like. They were strapped down. They were trying to pack as many slaves as they could into the bowels of the ship so they can get more profit when they would arrive into the Americas. So you're right next to each other the whole time. When you go to the bathroom, you're going to the bathroom where you're laying, where you're sitting. Um, so is the person next to you. So is the person next to them. So you're on the ship for a couple months, and you're sitting your own waist. Disease started just uh, dropping African slaves like crazy because it just they couldn't they couldn't withstand it. Now you might go, well, you know, some some might say, I'm just going to opt out. I'm going to not eat, and I'm going to just let myself die because I don't want to be a slave in a foreign land that I don't know any of the customs, language, culture. I'm away from my family. I'm just I'm done. Well, for the people that did not eat, they were made to eat. They used a device called the speculum uh, orum, which is basically, think of a, think of a s small in my hands, but a piece of metal that goes into your mouth. It starts cranking open like this. And then what they do is, in the middle here, they'll slide through a tube that goes down your, your throat. And they'll just, basically, they'll slide down a mixture of water and uh, rice or wheat or just this mixture. It's like a paste uh, that they would shove down you and make you eat. And that's how they got people to eat from one passage to the other. Uh, the other things that they would do before they got onto the ships is they would actually shave the heads of girl or boy alike. Uh, and this had to do with preventing lice and other uh, stuff to get on the ship. Uh, they would take the clothes off of the Africans' uh, slaves. They would also uh, brand them. And this is kind of a big thing because this shows you that dehumanizing element of making them feel like they're cattle or their animals, because that's what you do to cattle, that's what you do to mark your animals if you're a farmer, is to, to brand them. That's what they did to these African slaves. And uh, what would happen is you get marked based on which company owns you. So when you would finally dock in the Americas, they know which company you would belong to. Uh, so men were, uh, the ships were interesting the way they were designed. They were not designed like normal ships that you would see uh, out on, on voyage. Uh, they had nets on the outside. This was actually to catch any African slaves that are just trying to just jump off the ship and just be done. You're like, how did they get there? I'll talk about that later. Uh, they also had guns facing on the inside, which is just crazy because guns should be facing towards the outside. Artillery and guns should be facing towards the outside just in case you're attacked by pirates or any type of vessel that was, that was hostile. They were facing the inside just in case that there was uprisings. There's also had this thing called the barricado. The barricado is basically a wall. Uh, and you can see it on the picture here. It's like this brown line here. It's a wall that when they would make the slaves come up and exercise, they would, they, the crewman and the captain would sit behind this wall and they have guns pointed towards the African slaves as they exercise. Why did they have them exercise? Is because if they had African slaves just lay there for the entire voyage, their muscles would go through a process called atrophy. And what that means is your muscles become so weak for non-movement and non-use that they are relatively useless and it takes a long time to build that strength back up. So they would force the African slaves, men specifically, to come up on the deck of the ship to, to dance and do other exercises to get their, their body moving. Speaking of that, men were typically isolated below uh, in the, the, bo the bottom part of the ship uh, away from the women. Women were not chained up typically. They were allowed to wa walk within the quarters of the ship uh, to help out the crewmen to wash the ship and do other menial, uh, other jobs towards the ship. They were also uh, prone to be f abused physically. Uh, many women who went on the middle, middle Passage would actually end up in the Americas pregnant with the person that assaulted them on the ship.
Children uh, would be allowed to kind of go back and forth uh, and kind of go to either the, the male, uh, where the males were put in, in the bottom of the ship or where the females were, depending. So they kind of got uh, range to go wherever they wanted to. I do want to talk about one case study. Uh, it's the Zong trial. Zong, Z-O-N-G. Uh, the Zong trial had to do with uh, an insurance policy. So we get insurance for our cars or for our health. And if I have insurance, if I buy insurance for my car, what that means is if I get in an accident and it's my fault, my insurance will pay for some of it. And my, if I get in a car accident and somebody else's fault hits me, their insurance will pay for mine. Now, we pay this premium every month to make sure that if something happens, we get some money back in return. And this is what they did for African slaves. You can buy insurance policies on the slaves on your ship, so if something would happen to them, uh, you can still get money back from the insurance company. But insurance did not cover disease. And since disease was the big thing that killed most of the slaves, people didn't get a lot of that insurance claim money. So the captain of the Zong made uh, 100 plus, about 130 uh, African slaves, uh, throw them over, they threw, he threw them overboard uh, to claim insurance money. The reason why he did this is because their ship actually went off its voyage a little bit, and they were on. They were in the ocean about oh, about a half a month longer than they should have been. And disease started kind of growing within the ship. So he knew that he couldn't get money from the slaves that were still alive if they would eventually die from disease. But he could get money from them if he just threw them overboard and killed them that way. So they get to the shores and they sue their insurance company for this money for those 130 people that they killed. Uh, and the insurance company goes no, it goes to the court system. And their argument was, well, if you have cow or pigs that were diseased, you could throw them overboard uh, to save, save your crew or save the rest of the, the flock or the rest of the, the, the livestock. Why can't you do that with slaves? And the court actually upheld this. Now, what's the absurdity of this whole thing is that this court case was not about him killing the captain and the crew, killing 130 innocent people. No, that's not what the court case is about. The court case is about was the insurance company did not want to pay for those 130 people that were killed. And the, the, the other, the, the claimant, the captain and his crew were claiming we deserve money for killing those people. So it wasn't a trial to convict these people for murder. It was a trial to get people money for the murder that they committed. So, <clears throat> so they would get to land and they go to auction. In auction, what they would do is they would uh, dye the hair of African slaves to make them look younger. They would feed them up a little bit more right before the auction, and they would do things to make their, their cheeks look a little bit more rosy and more life to them, uh, basically to put them in auction. I mean, it's an auction. It's how much do you want to bid for this person? This is how they were treating human beings. They were putting them up for auction like you would a painting or a car. Or... So uh, that was the middle passage, and we're going to pick it up in a little bit with something more. The idea of why there was this, this push for African slavery, how did they justify it, what was the trip like from Africa to the Americas. Now let's talk about life as a slave. So uh, the first thing, let's talk about uh, where slavery took place uh, and where it was like the worst when it comes to work. Uh, yes, there was, there was cotton that was the big driver, and we'll talk about that with cotton gin uh, in a little bit. But uh, there was also the idea of tobacco, uh, rice. The rice fields of South Carolina and Florida were the worst. They were the worst conditions to work for, worst conditions people people could kill over right on the job. Um, the other idea is uh, how long did they work? Well, there's this, there's this saying that they would work from ken to can't. And that means they can see to when they can't see. So basically sun up to sundown. That's how long they work. Some plantations and some owners would make their uh, or have their African slaves uh, just work until a specific amount of job was done. Uh, but these working conditions were never the best. They, they weren't getting the same treatment as you would have somebody that's at a normal job today, obviously. Uh, they were also used, sold uh, periodically, randomly. And what that means is if you had family uh, within uh, your, on your plantation, so if you're an African slave and you married somebody on the, on the plantation, you had kids, your kids could be sold off. You could be sold off. Your wife could be sold off. So uh, it was the constant fear of sometimes people would go and do their work for the day in the fields, and they would come home and find that a family member has been sold off. They didn't even get to say goodbye. Uh, there's this constant state of fear. And along with the fear, there's the punishments. Uh, this right here is kind of a, just a quick representation of it. Uh, the cat on nine tails, uh, it's a whip, but it's a little bit different. 
Uh, it's a whip that has multiple different endings, so it kind of spreads out like fingers. So instead of the whip just being like one thing, it has like more things at the end. And each one has hooks or sometimes beads, metal beads. So when you would hit somebody with this cat o' nine tails, it actually ripped the flesh off. And we'll see pictures of people who are whipped with those in class later. The violence too, they would chop off uh, toes for runaway slaves. They would chop off a foot if a slave kept running away. Uh, why wouldn't they just kill them? It's because they want to still use them for labor. But if you're going to keep running away, we're going to make sure it's going to be really hard for you when you can't do it without, you know, without one foot. Um, and the punishments could be uh, for the most menial small offense to larger offenses. We'll talk about punishments for reading in a little bit. Uh, and the other idea to bring this up is uh, when people talk about uh, slavery, well, slavery was good for the owners. You know, I mean, you can make the argument that the owners made money and it was good. It actually wasn't from a sociological perspective, from like the perspective of their society was not actually benefiting from slaves. And how you can look at this is the violence. Violence breeds violence. Since they treated their slaves with such violence, they were also prone to treat other people in their culture violent too. The homicide rate, the murder rate, the um, uh, abuse rate of whites on whites in the South was higher than that of the North. The number of duels were higher in the South. And a duel, you know, a duel is, I challenge you to a duel, sir. And then they go out with, you know, pistols and they march, you know, a few yards away and then they are you ready, sir? And then one person gets the first shot, bang! And if they miss, the other person gets to shoot, and they just keep going. Eventually, after a couple shots, they go to, they, no joke, after a couple shots, if they both keep missing or the other person's not dead and they're still willing to go, they go to broadswords. So they go fight each other and hack each other to death with swords. This was happening in the South all the time. Violence breeds violence. Just because they made some money didn't make their society better. A, their society was so used to being violent towards African slaves, that violence turned towards their own people, towards other white plantation owners, towards other white people in their community. Violence breeds violence. Another thing that was tradition was uh, jumping the broom, and that's a term that you need to know. Jumping the broom was a tradition where, like, you, you'd get married if you're a slave, and you would jump the broom. When you jump, that means, like, you're now, as you land on the other side, you are now one. You are one couple. The reason why this is important is because marriages were enforced and encouraged by the slave owner. Why? Because if you were married, you could have kids. And those kids would become slaves. They would just be more slaves for the master. Also, it would make you less likely to rebel. Because if you have family on that plantation or a farm, because not all plantations, there weren't all plantations. Some people just owned one slave or a bunch of slaves. If you have family there, you're less likely to try to escape because you probably can't take them all with you because it'd be really hard to travel with a whole family and you're less likely to do something that might cause them harm. So you're more going to be more obedient if we, if, if they're given a wife and they have kids. Speaking of the cost for, for slaves, they're extremely expensive. Uh, so you only the richest people in the South would own the most slaves and some people only have one or two. Uh, and the, they, the equivalent almost of a car today, one slave is a, almost the equivalent of a car today. So think about that when you talk, think about the price of slaves. And uh, that is life as a slave. Uh, it was brutal. It was uh, heart-wrenching. Um, it was inconsistent sometimes because you didn't know if you were going to be sold off or not sold off or punished or not punished. Uh, and now we're going to get into slaves or just the African population and just uh, suffrage movement, or not suffrage movement, the, the uh, people that are pushing for the abolitionists who are pushing for the getting rid of slaves. We're going to talk about that. Okay, so this uh, next clip here is about three different people or uh, two really just different people and one really big event that you need to know about. Uh, the first one is Harriet Tubman. Oh, if you talk about someone in history that we should talk about a lot, it's this person right here. I love Harriet Tubman. This is why. She's not just the person that a lot of people are like, she's the Underground Railroad person. She is. She freed the slaves. She did. And all those things are amazing, but it's not even close to all the things that she did. She was a nurse. She was a scout. She was a spy. She was the first woman in U.S. history ever to plan and lead a military action. She went down and she actually freed 700 slaves with this military action. She was successful at doing it. After the war, she, she got money for schools. She got money for hospitals. She uh, was a big women's suffrage uh, movement uh, participant. Women's suffrage, by the way, 
getting women the right to vote. Make sure you know that suffrage isn't always bad. It's always good, actually. It's about people who mean to vote. So when they think suffrage, you think, oh, someone's being, you know, they're suffering. No, suffrage is good. It's about voting. So uh, she was all of these different things. Uh, she actually, when she went north the first time, she did not, uh, she came back 13 more times. So you got to think this. She risked her own freedom 13 more times to come back south to get more people to bring back up free them. Some of her family members, uh, she was a person that spent her life actually with, uh, with a, a, a problem with her head because when she was younger, there was an argument going on between two people and one of the people threw a weight, it was like a two pound weight, uh, and it uh, missed the person they were aiming at and it hit Harry Tubman right in the head. And what, caused, what it caused was she had migraines the rest of her life, but she also suffered what's called narcolepsy where she would fall asleep randomly. Uh, she was just... With, even with that, she was just this force of nature, this this force of freedom, this 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 this. Uh, just, she's somebody that if you're going to emulate, if you're going to respect, if you're going to want to become, uh, be somebody that stands up for other people like this. Harry Tubman, she's amazing. Next thing we're going to talk about is Nat Turner Rebellion. It's a little bit different. It's it's uh this is not going to be as easy to take both sides of an argument, which I try to teach you guys in this class. Try to understand two two sides of an argument. Uh, Nat Turner. Uh, also a slave. He was somebody who could read the Bible and he actually taught people the Bible. He was very smart. He escaped and then he actually came back willingly to his master and he said it's because the, basically the Bible instructed him to because he had higher, a higher mission. Uh, and then he planned a revolt. And originally, originally when he planned the revolt, uh, there was an eclipse and he's like, this is when we're going to do it. But then he got super sick. And he's like, oh, it's a sign, it's a bad omen, so we can't go do our rebellion yet, we can't revolt right now. So they call off the revolt, and then another eclipse, the same year takes place, and he goes, this is it. So him and about 60 other slaves, armed with knives, they first killed their masters while they were sitting in their bed. Uh, they left, and then they remembered there was one more person that was a member of that family, a baby. So they actually came back to the, to the, uh, the plantation, and they killed the baby in the crib. You're like, man, this guy sounds horrible. His reasoning was that baby's going to grow up and it's going to hate uh, people of a different color. He's going to try to enslave people. Got to kill him now. That's their thought. I'm not saying it's right. That's what he was thinking. And then they went to a school and they killed a bunch of people in the school. They ended up killing about 60 some odd people uh, with just knives. They butchered a bunch of people. Eventually the military was called in. Uh, they put down the rebellion pretty quick because when you have people with knives versus people with guns, you typically the people with guns are going to win. Uh, and Nat Turner actually went into hiding for about two months. He was eventually captured. He was tried. He was convicted, and then he was killed. Uh, his, his body was desecrated. Uh, it was basically mutilated, um, and the, the worst part was that the aftermath, the slaves that had nothing to do with this revolt uh, were being punished. P slaves were being killed because they thought they would become the next Nat Turner. Um, they also made it illegal for slaves to read punishable by death and by uh, by other punishments, either being whipped or having other things happening to you. So uh, Nat Turner's Rebellion, it was, uh, it's one of those things where it's kind of hard to go right for, be like, good job, Nat Turner. And you're like, but you did this. And it's it's I, it's I it's what history is. History isn't black and white. History is just bunches, bunches of shades of gray. And there's, there's good with the bad sometimes. So next thing is uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And uh, really what you need to know about this is it's one of the most sold books in the 1800s. The only thing that beat this was the Bible. But as far as novels go, it was the, the highest selling book of, of the 1800s. And the reason why it's important is it actually gave us a depiction of what slavery was. It was a fictional tale about slavery. But the person who wrote it, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, she actually wrote it based on actual slaves. So there, it's, it's, it's based on truth using fictional characters to represent them. Uh, actually, there's a moment where Abraham Lincoln meets Harriet Beecher Stowe, and they're like talking, and he goes, you're the little lady that started the big war. Because what happens is, this is read by so many people, this, this really in, uh, invites more people to become abolitionists or somebody that's against slavery. Uh, and this causes more and more fights, contention between anti-slavery, pro-slavery, and boom, we have the Civil War shortly afterwards. Uh, this book would eventually be banned in the South, and if you were caught with the book or reading the book, you could be in prison or you could be killed, depending on the infraction. And now we're going to talk about why the Civil War, the cause of the Civil War, uh, and I, I listed basically one cause at this point. Uh, but before we do that, I want you to understand the difference between a primary source and a secondary source. 
primary source is something that we take from that particular time. So it's the people that were living it, it's their ideas that are written down that we can take and we can use. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be written down, in this case, written down. Um, it is not an interpretation. An interpretation of an event uh, back then would be a secondary source. So someone looking at a primary source and then telling you what that primary source means, that's a secondary source. They didn't live at the time, they're just making their, their case of why this means what it means. So to understand why the uh, Civil War took place, we have to look at the primary documentation, the people that lived there, what they wrote, what their reasoning was, not someone's opinion about what they thought they were talking about, what they actually talked about. So we're going to look at what's called Declarations of Succession from the Confederate States. And again, we're going to get more into this later, but it's good to talk about this now with slavery. When you look at the Declarations of Succession, what they are is their rationale for leaving the United, United States of America becoming their own country. It's their reason, like it's their reasons for doing this. So let's not look into this too far, it's their reasons, so let's see what the reasons are. So here's a few states. Uh, we have uh, Texas, Declaration of Independence or Declaration of Succession. This was found in their primary documentation. The servitude of, African, of the African to the white race should exist for all future time. They put this in their Declaration of Succession which means this was something that they found as valuable to society, enough of which that they should leave the Union for. The next one is Mississippi. A blow to slavery is a blow to the, at the commerce and civilization. And by the way, Mississippi says more about slavery. This is just the one that I'm like, I'm, I gotta put the same thing with Texas. They mentioned slavery more than once. I'm putting the, the heavy hitters up there. A blow to slavery is the blow at commerce and civilization. They put this in their declaration to succeed from the Union, to leave the Union, to leave the country of the United States of America. This is one of their explanations for it. The next one is Georgia, and there is a lot here. Uh, I'm not going to read it verbatim, but over the last 10 years, we have had numerous series of causes to compliment, compl complaint against our non-slave holding Confederate states uh, with reference to the subject of African slavery. They have in uh, endeavored to weaken our society, society, to disturb our domestic peace and tranquility. Uh, basically, they're, they're talking about this idea of there's been conflict of our free states versus non-free states, essentially. Uh, they put this in a declaration of succession. They're talking about the conflict of slave or not slave. Uh, and then another one, I'm not going to go too far. I can go on with all the Confederate states, but I'm not going to. South Carolina actually spends a lot of theirs. I did not put the whole thing because they use kind of code words when they talk about slavery. Uh, they talk about the three-fifths clause, which basically means that uh, slaves are kind of three-fifths of a person. They go on and on about the right to property and property being a slave. Uh, and so the idea that uh, you have uh, a confusion or you have people that argue that it wasn't about slavery is, is, is nonsensical. These are the primary sources from the states themselves describing what the reason why they are succeeding from the union. Uh, the argument has been for a long time that it's because of states' rights. Well, the question is always should be asked right after, the, after that is states' right to do what? What about states' rights are you objecting to? concerning your willingness to leave the Union. And it always is going to come back to this idea of slavery. There's also the argument that uh, people in the South didn't all have slaves. True, that is very true. Not everyone in the South had slaves. Not everyone in the South, by the way, agreed with slavery either. Uh, but there were benefits to having slaves around because it made it another class of citizen. In other words, because slaves were around, you could never be considered the lowest class of citizen in the South because slaves were still in existence. And that came with different forms of privileges of living there. And I bring this up is because it took until 2019, 2019, last school year, where the Texas Board of Education voted to teach students slavery was the reason the South fought the Civil War. It took until last year. The Civil War was fought in the 1860s. It took until last year for Texas to acknowledge that slavery was a component part of the fight for the Civil War. Make sure you know your history, folks, and use primary sources. Primary sources tell you exactly what was going on. It's not interpretation. It's exactly what's happening. 
It's the minds of the people that were there. <sighs> this is the end of the slavery uh, lecture. I hope you, hope you didn't enjoy it uh, because, you know, slavery is something you shouldn't enjoy. But I hope you got something from it. See you in class tomorrow. Peace.